So two pieces of good news before we like start this handout. Um, we're following along with this handout, how to do kinematics problem. Uh -huh. um, piece of good news number one, yes, you get an equation sheet for your test. So these aren't equations that you have to memorize, but you do have to learn to apply them. Like you should know what each of these symbols mean and when to use each equation. And I'm gonna help us with that. Um, thing number two that is good, Let's say I give you a problem that's like calculate the height of a building. Well, on the test, I'm not going to tell you which method you have to use. You could graph out the velocities, like use the t-chart, make the graph, take the area under the curve, if that's what you're more comfortable with. Or you could use kinematics to do it, and both ways will give you the right answer, right? The way I'm showing you is a little bit more flexible in that it doesn't give you times this whole number increments all the time. You can use them for more types of problems, but I will take either answer for your test. So that's good, all right? So I'm figuring we've got all these equations and you're looking at them and you're like, oh, well, that's a lot. A uh, thing we should probably have first is what do all the symbols mean, all right? So there are six symbols for kinematics and they each represent something about a moving object. The X's are positions. So XI is the initial position. It's measured in meters. It is almost always zero. Almost always zero. There's gonna be like one case where it's not and I'm gonna point that out. So this number, maybe put a little star, almost always zero. XF then is our final position. Where does your object end up? That is usually some positive number measured in meters. If it's negative, it just means like you're going backward. Uh -huh. For velocities, VI is our initial velocity. It's measured in meters per second. And VF is our final velocity in meters per second. Sometimes if you're reading through a problem and you're looking at it and you're like, I can't tell um, what, I guess, what symbol this represents, sometimes you can figure it out from the units. If you see it's meters per second, I know it's at least one of the velocities. As you're solving some keywords to look for for velocities, look for words like rest or stopped. Those refer to when our velocity is zero. So if you see those keywords, that means one of the velocities is zero. Great. So two positions, two velocities. Because you have a moving object, the velocity changes, which changes where your object ends up. But you and I are always gonna just do constant acceleration. Acceleration, Let's say you figure out a thing and you can't figure out if it's like an acceleration or velocity. Sometimes the units of meters per second squared will help indicate what you're looking at there. A key thing to keep in mind is if it's a free fall problem, that means acceleration is negative 9.8. So maybe I'll say something is falling, but I don't put the 9.8 in the word problem. You can still use that as a thing that you know. And last is time. Time is measured in seconds. So if I say something like it falls for three minutes, then change that minutes to seconds. Lots of symbols. But those symbols are like a really good first step to solving these problems. So as I solve a problem like this, what I first wanna do is I first wanna list what I call the knowns and unknowns. So in our slow jogger, our jogger is running and they start from rest. That means that our initial velocity is zero. So step one, we're gonna read this problem really carefully. And it first thing says like it starts from rest. So that means the I is zero. Jogger run, run, runs and accelerates at a uniform rate of 0.25 meters per second squared. All right, it says, what is the velocity of the stroller after it has traveled eight meters? 
So I know I'm looking for final velocity of the stroller. So VF, I'm gonna put a little box around the things I don't know, All right? And it says it's traveled eight meters. So assume XF is zero. XI, let's say my jogger starts from rest, assume they start from the origin. So you can all, almost always assume XI is zero. And the thing that I, I don't know is I don't know the time. This is a really good first step because let's say that you read through the problem carefully. This pairs the numbers in the problem, whether they're like outwardly stated like the eight or implied like the zero. It pairs all the numbers. So when I have the equation, I know what to plug in. Plus, once you get here, there's a really easy check to see if you found all the things. The really easy check with this is that there should be four things I know and two things I don't. It'll always be four things known to two things unknown. So I know I have found all the numbers. Um, where this comes from is that technically there's three equations, but only two of them are unique. If I have two equations, the most I can solve for is two unknowns. So I can't have more than two things missing. Yes. Did you say that it'll always be like that? You'll know four and then you'll find two? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it'll always be like that. It'll always be no four, find two. Now, this time the problem only asks us to find one of the two. So what is the velocity? So here's my trick for how to pick out the right equation, right? Because there's three of them and you're looking at them and you're like, oh gosh, the letters, All right? How are you gonna do it? Is you wanna pick an equation that has the thing you're looking for. So pick an equation that has VF. That's the thing I'm looking for but not the other unknown, All right? So it has the F, but not time, the other unknown. That narrows it down. There's only one equation I can use to solve it. And I know you don't wanna do guess and check. Right? Guess and check would be awful. Hey, so which equation can I use to solve this? Left, right, or center? Right, right. right. so I'm gonna write down this equation. That's VF squared equals VI squared plus two A change in X. You get a point for writing this equation in this form. So don't put in the numbers first. Because the thing is, I need to know what equation you pick. What if you pick the wrong one and like your math is fine, but you picked the thing that didn't solve for it. Since I have to know what equation you're picking, write this equation out. Then all I need to do is substitute and solve. So I'm gonna leave VF as VF. I know sometimes in math, you're like, well, I solve for X. VF is the thing I'm looking for. Let's put an X there. No. Don't do that because X's are somewhere else in this problem too. That's too many X's. We don't want three X's, right? We wanna do like, I wanted all numbers. So I'm putting VI as zero. I'm putting A as 0.25. I want something that's all numbers with one variable I don't know. XF is eight, XI is zero. And this method helps if you're a person that like sometimes looks at algebra problems and you're like, I don't know how to solve the thing. If you write the original equation first and then put the numbers in right below it, it makes sure you've lined everything up and then you can follow your problems a little better. So if I want to solve for VF, I can plug all of the thing on the right into my calculator. So VF squared is equal to 2 times 0.25 times 8, and that's just 4. How do I solve from here? Um, square root 4. Yeah, I'm going to square root that 4. And I know my people who are like really good at math, you're looking at it and you're like, it's plus or minus 2. Yeah, but plus two only is the one that makes sense. All right, I know that the mathematical solution is plus or minus two for a square root. Do, do not worry, plus two is the only one that makes sense. I can't accelerate forward and end up with a negative velocity, that's weird. 
All right. So that's how we solve a kinematics problem. And since I've only asked for one variable, I don't need to go back and solve for t. Okay. This time it doesn't ask for it. So you don't have to. Huh? Is it going to ask for it sometimes? Yes. My next one's going to ask for both. Okay. But I'll show you a trick for that too. So break down for steps, knowns and unknowns. Pick up, uh, pick the right equation, an equation that has the variable you're looking for and not the other unknown. Then solve by substituting, right? All right, so let's do this drag parachutes one. This is just going to be up on top. So if you're still like taking a look at that, you can use that one. So drag parachutes. What I want you to do is try to do the first step for yourself. Go figure out the knowns and unknowns. Take like 30 seconds to read this car problem. So who thinks that they can do one of the things you know in this problem? Actually, there's six things. There's six things, so I'll just pick one from each group. So how about Jacob's group? Can you tell me one thing? Time is six seconds. All right. All right. Down. Good. 40 meters per second to start. How about Harrison? I, did, I didn't hear the beginning. Mm -hmm. Initial position of zero. All right. Final velocity of zero. All right, which means my last two are things I don't know. So I'm gonna put a little box around them. All right, this is one that asks you to find both distance and acceleration. And it makes sense in this case to find the, um, find the acceleration first, All right? So if I'm finding the acceleration first, I want to pick an equation that has acceleration, the thing I'm finding first but not xf. So what equation is that? Ah, the first one. So that's final velocity is equal to initial plus at. Right? So a final velocity of zero is equal to 40 plus a, and t is six. So now, now it's the algebra step. I'm going to subtract 40 from both sides. And that says negative 40 is equal to 6a. I'm going to divide to get rid of the multiplying by 6. So dividing 6 on both sides. And that leaves a is negative 6.67 meters per second squared. So I know that this acceleration should be negative because my velocity is positive. The acceleration is negative. This is a slowing down object. Since velocity and acceleration are in opposite directions, that's slowing down. That's what I'm looking for. Oh, nice thing. If you have a problem where you have to find both variables, it doesn't matter what equation you pick to find the second equation. Find the second variable. So if I'm finding the second variable, pick any other equation. I think the middle one's easier. <laughs> the middle one solves for XF. So I'm looking at it and I'm like, all right, this one solves for the thing I'm looking for anyways. I might as well use this one. When you get a choice to pick any equation, pick the easiest equation, right? You could totally use that last equation, but this is easier. This one says xf is equal to zero plus 40 times six plus one half, 6.67 is my acceleration, and time is six squared. Um, thing to point out here, in that equation with t squared, t is the only thing that's squared. So if you wanna put little parentheses here, this like t is the only thing that's squared, not the a or the one half. 
So, hey, I don't have to algebra this at all. I can just plug this into my calculator exactly how it is. I don't need to rearrange because it's already solved for XF. So, let's see, 40 times 60 is 240. This quantity I've already plugged into my calculator is 120. And it's negative because that negative 6.7 is going backward, is accelerating in the negative direction. So that XF is 120 meters. This is a car that's like traveling fast to start and get slower and slower and slower until it stops. And it takes 120 meters to do so. Its velocity was to the right, but its acceleration is to the left. So it's slowing down. So before we try the problem on the back page, which is our last new one of the day, I want to point out that I've written this problem on the back page to go along with like a really common myth. Um, how many people have heard the myth about objects dropped from the top of the Empire State Building? So for the problem on the back page then, it starts from an unknown height and ends on the ground. So XF is zero. Usually it'll be one of the positions is zero. This time XI is not zero because it starts from above the ground and moves down. This problem is one of those that's a free fall problem where like you should know the negative 9.8. It's just not included in the wording. So look for the word free fall and assume that acceleration is negative 9.8. Okay, so we're trying to find the initial height and the time and it doesn't matter which I chose first, um, but let's just do height first because it seems to be like that's what it was asked for first. So when I pick an equation, I need to pick an equation with height, but not time. So with xi, not t. So I'm going to use the third equation for that. The third equation is the one with the vf squared. That is the ratio of the velocities, the acceleration and position, but doesn't have a time in it. So this is tricky because I'm gonna have to find Xi. For Vf, I'm plugging in negative 93. Lunch wave three, beginning at this time, please report to your sign location for lunch wave three. All right, initial velocity zero. Acceleration is negative 9.8. XF is zero and XI I don't know. Notice when I do this, like this means I'm going to need to do a bunch of math in my calculator beforehand. You can't really do this one all in one step. So I'm doing that negative 93 squared and I get 8649. On the right hand side, I'm going to do 2 times negative 9.8 to get me negative 19.6. And in the parentheses, that's negative xi. Those negatives cancel out, so do not worry here. The negative for negative 19.6, because think I multiplied these two together. And the negative from here, those two negative signs cancel, right? Then I can solve this. I can divide by 19.6 on both sides. So that xi is 8,649 over 19.6. It's something like 441 meters or something like that. Yeah, 441.3 meters. So that's really, really tall. If you're a person that plays football, think that this is uh, four football fields vertically on top of each other is how tall that building is, right? Incredibly tall. All right, then to solve for time, pick any other equation. I think the first equation is the easiest to work with. So pick any other equation to solve for time. I picked the first equation because like I'd rather choose the easier equation than the difficult one. So the final velocity is negative 93. The initial velocity is zero. Acceleration is negative 9.8. 
my negative sides cancel. So negative cancels negative. So I'm left with 93 equals 9.8t. Divide the 9.8 to the other side. And that gives me 9.5 seconds. Can you see how I probably wouldn't want to do this one as like a graph method? I'd be subtracting 9.8 over and over and over and over. And then it still wouldn't even give me a whole number, right? I'd see that the velocity, like, it goes to like negative 88 and then negative 99 or something like that right after each other. I wouldn't be able to get the exact time from that other method. Dominic. Um, why is the, why is the negative sign? Oh, on which one, this one? Uh, yeah. Oh, when you do zero minus something, I drop the zero. So then I have negative 9.8 and negative 93. So just for funsies on the bottom of this, I had us plot the velocity versus time graph, but doing that as your solving method would have been problematic. You'd go and graph this and it wouldn't give you a whole number increment for the times, right? You'd go and graph this and like, you'd have to repeatedly subtract 9.8 a lot of times. So that's where kinematics would be extra helpful, right? Now, just so that we have this graph, I'm gonna show you the difference between like, what this is in theory versus what it is with actual air resistance. Because in theory, this object falls for 9.5 seconds and is going negative 93 meters per second at the end. An incredibly fast speed. Um, if you're not familiar with meters per second, let's see what that is in miles per hour. Something like 200 miles per hour if there was no air resistance, right? So let's say this is um, 200 miles per hour down here, but with air resistance, Air resistance prevents that acceleration from reaching that value. With air resistance, it does speed up, but it levels out. So that it's traveling at that constant terminal velocity. The terminal velocity of the penny that they mentioned is only 65 miles per hour. So it never reaches that 200 miles per hour like maximum that it could from free fall. So with air resistance, it'll take a really long time to fall. Think like the area under the curve. You would need a really long time to make those areas equal, right? Because the velocity is small, it's gonna take a lot longer to fall with air resistance. 